Hello, everyone. If I could just ask everyone to please take your seat. We're very excited to start. So good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, since its establishment in 1906, the Society has served as a premier convener of the international law community, with a particular focus on creating opportunities for dialogue with senior officials on issues of international law and policy. This keynote is the proud continuation of that tradition, and I couldn't be more pleased or feel more lucky to have with us today U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman. Wendy Sherman was confirmed by the Senate on April 13, 2021, and sworn in the following day as the 21st Deputy Secretary of State and the first woman to hold that position. She previously was Professor of the Practice of Public Leadership and Director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. She was also Senior Fellow at the school's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and a Senior Counselor at Albright Stonebridge Group. From 2011 to 2015, Deputy Secretary Sherman served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, where she traveled to 54 countries and led the U.S. negotiating team that reached agreement on a joint comprehensive plan of action between the P5 plus one, the European Union, and Iran, for which, among other diplomatic accomplishments, she was awarded the National Security Medal by President Barack Obama. I know personally from the privilege of having served in L as counselor in the legal advisor's office that she could not have been more highly regarded by her colleagues at the State Department and far beyond. Deputy Secretary Sherman previously served as counselor under Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, as special advisor to President Clinton and policy coordinator on North Korea, and as assistant secretary for legislative affairs under Secretary of State Warren Christopher. She also served on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, the U.S. Department of Defense's Defense Policy Board, and the Congressional Commission on the Prevention of Weapons of Mass Destruction, Proliferation, and Terrorism. I could go on, <laughs> but I won't right now. <laughs> Deputy Secretary Sherman, we know what an incredibly busy time it is for you, and we're honored that you've taken the time to speak to us today. The Secretary has agreed to answer questions, but we will be taking questions on the app only, so please submit those for the Q&A session. Deputy Secretary Sherman, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. It's a real honor to join the American Society of International Law for your annual meeting. Thank you, Catherine, for your warm welcome and kind introduction. I also want to thank your executive director, Mark A. Grass, your deputy executive director, Wes Rist, and the entire ASIL team for organizing a really extraordinary program this week. I know these events are a huge undertaking, so Congratulations to you all. I also want to thank Catherine for waking everybody up and saying good afternoon. I do that too when we have our expanded meetings and I don't stop until people really give me a rousing good afternoon just to get all of our blood flowing up for all of the difficult work ahead. This society and the State Department have a very long history together. More than 100 years ago, Secretary of State Elihu Root was ASIL's first president. The State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor works closely with ASIL and with many ASLI members on an ongoing basis. I know our acting legal advisor, Rich Bissick, our ambassador at large for global criminal justice, Beth Van Schock, and many of our outstanding colleagues from L, as we say, we all have letters here, have been in attendance throughout the week Catherine herself, as she just noted, previously served as the State Department's counselor for international law. And in the spirit of this year's annual meeting theme, personalizing international law, I have to share that I recently learned as we were putting these remarks together that my own chief of staff, Mustafa Popal, was an ASIL intern back when he was a student. Many of you, I am sure, have been closely following the events in Ukraine and the premeditated, unprovoked, unjustified, and horrifying war of choice 
that Russian President Vladimir Putin has unleashed there. Every day since February 24th, just six weeks ago, has brought new stories, new videos, new images that cut to your core. Bombs and missiles raining down on hospitals, on apartment buildings, on grocery stores, even on lines of civilians waiting for humanitarian assistance, just waiting to get bread. Journalists and priests and local leaders abducted, some killed. The beloved mayor of Motijin and her husband and son found executed in a shallow grave their hands tied behind their backs. And now, the utter devastation of countless small towns liberated, liberated from Russian, Russian control. Entire blocks bombed out in Borodyanka, with hundreds of residents missing. Appalling scenes in Bucha, where civilians have been found in mass graves and shot dead in the streets, some with their hands bound. Reports of torture, of rape, of men, young and old, executed on their knees, of civilians' lifeless bodies desecrated and left booby-trapped with explosives. Credible reports that Russians and Russian forces are forcing tens of thousands of Ukrainians to relocate to Russia, confiscating their passports and cell phones, separating family members from each other in so-called filtration camps. And earlier today, a horrifying missile attack on the train station in Kramatorsk in eastern Ukraine, where perhaps thousands of civilians were packed cheek by jowl on the platforms waiting to evacuate. Ukrainian officials have said at least 50 people, and now I'm hearing quite a lot more, were killed and nearly 100, perhaps more, wounded. At least two of the dead are children. And as I just noted, we must brace ourselves for all of those numbers and all of the children's numbers to rise. It's hard to fathom how much destruction, how much pain Putin's war of choice, and I say war of carnage, has caused in such a short time. Just six weeks ago, just six weeks ago. The southeastern city of Mariupol was a peaceful place. Children were in school. The port was bustling with workers exporting steel and grain. Last year, the city was even named Ukraine's great cultural capital, with a busy calendar of art exhibits, plays, and concerts. Today, Mariupol is in ruins. We have seen devastating strikes on civilian infrastructure, a maternity and children's hospital bombed, heavily pregnant women evacuated over the rubble. Some died. The regional theater bombed while it was filled with sheltering civilians, while the word deity, children, was written in enormous white letters on the ground outside. The city has been cut off from power, from water, from food and medicine, from humanitarian aid. And now Mariupol's mayor has said that Russian forces are using mobile crematoria to hide the true civilian toll of the devastation they have unleashed on that city. Imagine crematoria. Two weeks ago, Secretary Blinken announced that based on information currently available, the US government assessed that members of Russian forces have committed war crimes in Ukraine. The scenes outside of Kyiv, the ongoing brutality in Mariupol, the missile strike on civilians and Kramatorsk suggest that these events aren't isolated incidents or cases of individual soldiers going rogue. They appear to be evidence of a deliberate, troubling campaign. And those responsible for these atrocities, including those who ordered them, must be, must be, and will be held to account. The United States and our allies and partners are tracking and documenting atrocities in Ukraine so that we can share information with the institutions working to hold these respons those responsible accountable for their actions. 
We are also supporting international accountability mechanisms and NGOs documenting human rights abuses. At the request of Ukraine's prosecutor general, the United States is providing support for a team of international prosecutors to work directly with the prosecutor general's war crimes unit, collecting, preserving, and analyzing evidence. We helped establish a commission of inquiry at the UN Human Rights Council to investigate all abuses of human rights, violations of international law and related crimes. The International Criminal Court's prosecutor has also launched an investigation and the OSCE has stood up a fact-finding mission. Now I cannot pretend we'll get accountability overnight. You all in this audience better than most know how challenging this process is as lawyers and as human beings. It takes time to collect evidence, to verify eyewitness accounts, to make attributions, to identify perpetrators, to build as watertight a case as possible. At the same time, we are confronted every day with new horrors, brought straight to our phone screens, thanks to the power of social media. And sometimes those horrors prompt an understandable human response, which is to question the utility and effectiveness of our rules-based international order, and indeed of international law, if we are powerless to stop Putin and his armies of brutalizing the people of Ukraine. But it is international law that has provided the framework and the language for addressing this conflict. The UN Charter's prohibition on the threat or use of force underpinned the UN General Assembly vote in early March, where 141 nations condemned Russia's aggression against Ukraine, and just four stood with Russia. The incredibly robust coordinated effort to impose sanctions and export controls in response to Russia's egregious violation of international law is made possible by the hard work of lawyers in the United States and in allied and partner nations, including, I'm sure, some of you here today. International organizations have taken unprecedented steps to respond as well. The Council of Europe voted to eject Russia, determining its egregious violations of the organization's principles were too serious for Russia to remain a member. Yesterday, the UN General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council because a country that is responsible for systematic violations of human rights should not be part of an institution whose very purpose is to protect those rights. I fully expect that until President Putin agrees to a ceasefire, withdraws every Russian troop from Ukraine's sovereign territory and moves his forces away from Ukraine's borders, Russia will remain a pariah in the international community. And the United States, our allies and partners and nations around the world will continue to hold Russia accountable for its actions. Now I know not everyone in the world is experiencing Putin's invasion of Ukraine in the same way. I've traveled to other parts of the world besides Europe. And I know that many people, many nations are facing challenges much closer to home. Families have been thrown into poverty by two years of this grinding pandemic. Even before Putin further invaded Ukraine, the world had more people living as refugees than at any time since World War II. Putin's war is now causing chaos in the oil and gas markets, driving up energy prices for those who can least afford it. It is disrupting international shipping of critical commodities like wheat, which Russia and Ukraine have long supplied to much of the world that millions of people depend on to survive. Now Putin's war is threatening to create a global food security crisis on top of many countries which are already food insecure. But regardless of each country's, each family's, each person's immediate concerns, even when those concerns are very, very serious, this crisis will nevertheless impact every single person in the world because a threat to the rules-based international order, to international law anywhere, risks undermining it everywhere. 
No country has the right to dictate another country's political choices or to change another country's boundaries by force or to choose another country's alliances for them. Those are rights inherent to each sovereign state. In a democracy like Ukraine, they are rights that belong to the Ukrainian people. And when autocrats like Putin believe they can act with impunity and violate those rules and principles, that makes all of us, all of us, less secure. Even as so many of us are working on an ongoing basis to support Ukraine and the Ukrainian people and to hold Vladimir Putin and his enablers accountable for his war of choice, we are continuing our diplomatic and legal engagements with every region of the world. We are working with our allies and partners to uphold the international legal framework governing the oceans and seas, which is under enormous pressure in the South China Sea, where the People's Republic of China has unlawfully claimed sovereignty or some form of exclusive jurisdiction over some 70% of an economically and strategically critical waterway. And we are continuing our efforts to put human rights at the center of US foreign policy. Recently, Secretary Blinken formally determined that members of the Burmese military, Myanmar, committed genocide and crimes against humanity, against the Rohingya in that country. We also recently provided an additional $1 million in funding for the independent investigative mechanism for Myanmar to assist efforts to hold those responsible for the genocide and other atrocities against Rohingya to account. All told, the Department of State is leading at least 59 negotiations to uphold and strengthen elements of the rules-based international order from promoting global health to protecting the environment to combating cybercrime to upholding human rights. I wanna end on a bit of a personal note. Unlike many people who work in foreign policy and national security, I'm not a lawyer. My daughter is, but I'm not. I'm an academ not an academic expert. I wasn't trained in foreign policy and national security. I was trained as a social worker, as a community organizer and a clinician. And I worked on Capitol Hill before coming to the State Department for the first time during President Clinton's first term. So let's just say it's not a typical background for a Deputy Secretary of State, but it's a background that has served me well and enabled me to serve the interests of the United States, at least I hope so. I like to say that in many ways, I'm still a social worker. It's just that my caseload has changed because whether I'm negotiating with foreign counterparts or working through an interagency policy process within our own government, I still draw on the same core skills to put myself in another person's shoes and to try to understand their perspective, their motivations, their history, their goals, to bring people together to achieve an objective, to try to find common ground, to remain calm when others aren't, but not to stifle my own emotions, to bring my whole self to the table. That is something I learned in an even deeper way from my dear friend and former boss, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, who, as you all know, died just a few weeks ago. Unlike me, Secretary Albright held a PhD. She wrote her dissertation on the Prague Spring. She got a PhD in Russian studies at Columbia. She spoke several languages and was a superb diplomat. But her real magic was how she brought herself, her whole self to everything she did, and especially to her lifelong advocacy for democracy and human rights. The outlines of Secretary Albright's bio biography are well known, but they bear repeating. Born in what was then Czechoslovakia, her family fled the Nazis to shelter in London. London. They returned to Prague after the war only to flee again to keep her father from being imprisoned or worse when the communists seized power. She arrived in America as a refugee on a ship that docked at Ellis Island in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty. Madeline made no bones about the fact that she was such an ardent advocate for democracy and for Americans' leadership in the world because of her and her family's experiences. Those of us fortunate enough to be born in the United States, even though our parents may have been refugees or our grandparents or our great-grandparents, 
and in other well-established democracies can all too easily take this privilege for granted. But those who have seen the alternative with their own eyes, the repression, the state control, the hatred, the death and destruction, they have a different perspective. They know how precious and how precarious democracy, human rights, and the rule of law really are. And they know they have to bring their whole selves to the fight for freedom. That is why, as Secretary Madeleine Albright, she marshaled the world to protect Kosovar Albanians from slaughter. It's why she fought passionately to expand NATO to Central Europe and grow the arsenal of democracies. Painfully, it is why she always said her greatest regret was not doing more to stop the genocide in Rwanda. And it is why she continued to work on behalf of democracy after she left the State Department in her books and her public appearances as the long serving chair of the National Democratic Institute, as the frequent convener of the Aspen Ministers Forum, a group of foreign ministers she cheekily liked to call Madeline and her exes. She believed in democracy and in human rights with her whole being, and she fought for them to the very end of her life. So that's my advice to you. Take a page from Madeline's book, from your own lives. Bring your whole selves to your work. Bring your humanity to your work. One of my colleagues today in a staff meeting thanked me for doing that for bringing my whole self, for integrating all the pieces of me, all the parts of my life. I couldn't have thought of a higher compliment from anyone. I know it might make some of you nervous. Lawyers are trained to be careful, to be deliberate, to marshal facts and evidence, to hew to every rule in the blue book and for good reason. Cases can be won and lost on technicalities. And when you are working on painful issues, on war crimes in Ukraine or genocide in Burma, Myanmar, or sexual violence under ISIS or media freedom in Hong Kong, I know it can be tempting. It can feel safer to push your emotions down and try to be dispassionate. Don't. Don't become numb. Don't become clinical. Don't lose touch with yourself, with your emotions, with your human impulses, because at its core, the work of international law, just like all of the work of diplomacy, is about people, about human beings, about righting wrongs, about pursuing justice, after punishing wrongdoing, about building a better, freer, safer, and more just world for people everywhere. And none of that will happen without each and every one of you bringing your humanity to what you do. We saw that again on display today when President Biden welcomed the soon to be new Associate Justice, Judge Jackson, to a ceremony on the South Lawn. Judge Jackson bought her whole self. She thanked everybody by name, not something everybody does. She kept taking out her Kleenex to wipe her eyes. The emotion was so present she talked about all who had come before who, her, who brought her to this extraordinary day, to this moment in history, to the arc of justice, which may be slow, but was coming and had come for another chapter today. Please, please bring all that you are to everything you do. Thank you again for having me and thank you for everything you do to uphold and strengthen international law, international organizations, and the rules-based order. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Deputy Secretary, thank you so much for those stirring words and to you for bringing your full self and sharing your full self with us this evening. So we've had questions rolling in. I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative and just start us off. Um, and I wanna focus on the sanctions. Uh, 
Over the last few days, you've gone on record to say that the sanctions imposed on Russia over the war in Ukraine should give China a, and I'll quote, good understanding of the consequences it could face if it provides material support to Russia. You've also noted signs of China being conflicted about being so closely linked to Russia at this moment in history. What trajectory do you foresee for China's relationship with Russia? And how do you see that relationship impacting the conflict or its potential resolution? Well, thank you all for starting me off with a very tough and mm. complex question. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> um, China, the People's Republic of China, has said itself that it is a partner with Russia, longstanding partner. We all read, or many of you may have, the manifesto that they both put out, uh, both uh, Putin and Xi, uh, at the start of the Olympics. But uh, the PRC has also said it is not an alliance, which in itself is maybe to most people's ear doesn't say much, but clearly was trying to say, Yes, they're important in our lives. Yes, they are partners, but it doesn't go as far as it could. Um, on the resolutions up until the Human Rights uh, Council, uh, China abstained. So they didn't vote no, which would have aligned themselves completely with Russia. They abstained because they have certainly made a case uh, constantly for sovereignty, territorial integrity, and a right for a sovereign nation to decide its own polit political future, its own foreign policy. So it's sort of awkward for them not to be for sovereignty, territorial integrity, and not taking, sorry, I'm getting some water, thank you, uh, a sovereign uh, country by force. Um, and I think they are trying to walk a very difficult path. I'm not naive. Uh, Russia and China are uh, partners. They work together. Um, they believe in uh, a kind of use of power that is different than what we believe in in a democracy. Uh, they use methodologies that are different than we in democracies do. But I see Russia and China quite differently. Um, Putin has now shown himself to be capable of extraordinary brutality, uh, taking a sovereign nation by force, further taking a sovereign nation by force, because of course he had already uh, attempted to illegally annex Crimea and had established those little green men in uh, uh, Donetsk and uh, in the Donbas and in Luhansk. And in many ways, other than the fact that Russia did have an economy, does have oil, and is a member of the Security Council, is a huge country by geography, and has nuclear weapons, they are not a powerful country for the future of this world in the way that the PRC certainly is. I, is the PRC right now the largest country in the world by population? but a growing economy, though not growing as fast as they had hoped, uh, one that has invested a great deal uh, in trying to bring uh, their citizens into a middle class. So they're not the same. They're just not the same. And I think what Putin has done is to reduce himself and his country into a tiny little person as she tries to make himself into a even more powerful leader than he already is. That said, as Secretary Blinken has long said, our, our relationship with the PRC is very complex. We compete in many arenas, and we hope they will do so responsibly with the rules-based international order that got them to the point of development where they are now letting them into the WTO and supporting them to do so. Uh, the UN Charter, uh, other rules-based international order, the rules of the road help China get where it is. 
Now they want to change those rules. And so we're gonna challenge those rules when they try to claim territory in the South China Sea and claim over uh, the seas that are really an essential um, cargo path for the world. It doesn't belong uh, to China. So we have said very directly, uh, the president to Xi Jinping, uh, Jake Sullivan to Yang Chu, the secretary to Wang Yi, me to the ambassador here, that we understand they have interests and they aren't all the ones we have, they're different. But if they send weapons, provide material support to Russia in its premeditated, unprovoked and unjust invasion of Ukraine, there will be consequences. And my comments at the House Foreign Affairs Committee the other day was not to say they're going to get exactly the consequences that Russia has, because Russia, of course, is President Putin is the one who started this invasion and is creating this uh, horrible uh, brutality. But they would be complicit. And there would be consequences. And the kinds of things we are capable of doing, since we have such an extraordinary alliance, not just with Europe, but around the world, 140 countries uh, just voted and 141 countries before that, and another set of countries voted to kick Russia off the Human Rights Council. This is a worldwide set of alliances and partnerships that will come to bear uh, if, in fact, the PRC uh, becomes materially complicit in this horror show that we're all watching. Thank you. Let me ask you one more question, and it's, it's a bit more conceptual, and it goes to the point that you made quite rightly that while there's been a lot of criticism of international law institutions, there's also been on display the power of international law and institutions in providing the language and the framework in thinking about these actions. It connects very much to multilateralism, and I think there's been very, you know, as you've, as you've seen and heard, this death knell of multilateralism. It certainly hasn't, doesn't appear to have been the approach of the Biden administration to treat it as dead. I'd love to get your thoughts on where you think multilateralism stands today and where you think it'll be in five years, and then maybe we'll take it out to 20 years. When President Biden became president, he said that he was going to reestablish our partnerships and our alliances around the world. And he has, and we have and we work on it every single day. When I went to the NATO Russia Council meeting, when we were trying to get Putin to take the path of diplomacy, though in retrospect, he'd probably already made his decision, Russia sent a delegation to that body of 30 nations at NATO. I made my remarks and then I sat there for four hours and listen to every one of those 30 countries stand up for the same set of principles. It, it was extraordinary. And it had, I'm sure, the Russians left thinking they could have divided us and seen that was not possible. They have seen in the imposition of sanctions and export controls and designations of entities and individuals that we are working together with partners and allies, of course, with the European Union, with Canada, with the UK, Australia, New Zealand, but Japan has come forward. Switzerland has changed its position of neutrality. Countries have done things they have never done before. The European Union agreed on 500 million euros available to countries who needed financial support to send weapons to Ukraine. EU's never done something like that before. So I think what you have seen in this horrible crisis is unbelievable unity. People point as well to the very, very, very difficult withdrawal from Afghanistan. It was hard to watch some of those scenes and of course hard to lose some of our American military colleagues. But we also got 125,000 people evacuated in 17 days. And we did it in part because we worked with others. Every day for weeks, I had a VTC 
with 30, turns out it was 30 countries for the most part, has nothing to do with the 30 NATO countries because these were countries from all over the world, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Europe, to try to share information, work evacuation plans, work countries that could accept refugees, uh, work onward countries that ex could accept refugees. Um, it, an, an amazing network of countries. Uh, and it went on like that for days. So partnerships and alliance are critical. So I think, and we've seen that the UN, maybe the UN General Assembly now more than the UN Security Council because Russia and China are on the Security Council has been an incredible instrument, incredible. Um, so I think right now alliances are critical. In the Asia, we have made ASEAN centrality uh, very core to everything we do. I could go on and on. I won't give you every example. Uh, 10 years from now, I hope people understand that we all do better. Uh, you know, we teach our kids work and play well with others, <laughs> that you'll, you'll have a better life. Uh, it'll be more fun. <laughs> you'll get more done. Uh, it's true in the international arena as well. So I hope it remains true. 20 years from now, I also hope it remains true. Does it mean there doesn't need to be some reform of these institutions? Of course, there needs to be. And NATO is going to be in the Madrid summit in June uh, talking about the strategic concept for 2030. And even what they had planned will now have to be rethought because geopolitics is a result of this premeditated, unjust and unprovoked invasion has changed the world. Thank you. I know we have you for just a few more minutes. Um, let me go to an audience question. What does the war in Ukraine do for the prospects of a return to the Iran nuclear deal? Another easy one. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Iran nuclear deal um, is really sort of in the final stages of either happening or not. <laughs> and it is like many complex negotiations like this. It's not about are you 90% there? It's binary. You either get the deal or you don't. Uh, and there are a couple of remaining issues that people are working very hard on to see if there is a way forward. And because this is a multilateral negotiation, we aren't the only player. In fact, during this JCPOA negotiation, Rob Malley, who is the lead uh, for the negotiating team, has been in a separate hotel mm -hmm. and hasn't been able to have direct negotiations with the Iranians. It's been a very strange negotiation. Uh, he's been doing it largely through the Europeans, the E3, uh, and coordinated by the European Union. So it's been very, very strange negotiation. I. I don't think this is particularly going to affect the outcome. Um, I think it is on its own path. If, there's no question that it's sort of hard to work with Russia at the moment and pretty hard to work with uh, China, maybe a little less so, uh, but we're at a point where they are not gonna be deciding factors in whether we get to a deal or not get to a deal. Okay, and final question, because I, I do know you need to leave, and uh, this will be very short in terms of the response, although it's a bit complicated. Uh, a year in, what has surprised you most? What have you considered the, the most challenging, and what keeps you up at night? But on the other side, a year in, what gives you hope? You can answer one or both. <laughs> <laughs> um. A year in, I think um, it's not so much surprising. Everyone is exhausted. Uh, people are personally exhausted from the pandemic and from its ongoing, just sort of eating away at our ability to be with other and eat each other. And every time we get together, I hope this will not be true for your conference, <laughs> um, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, we find out that, in fact, uh, we're all taking risks. <laughs> People get COVID. Uh, fortunately, most of us are, are vaccinated and boosted, and so we get through it. But people are very weary, and they're trying to manage their kids, their parents, uh, life, uh, deal with economics. And that's just for us privileged folks. 
people in countries in the developing world are really, really, really struggling, really, really struggling. And now they are struggling even more. And we have to work incredibly hard with those alliances and those partnerships to tackle what are really mega issues, uh, climate, energy security, global health, food security, uh, the things that we all may not think about every day, but most people in the world do think about every day. Um, so that, that is hard. What gives me hope? I have phenomenal colleagues uh, who get up every day and work so hard, work so hard all around the world. They have been resilient in this really hard time. I'm also um, older than virtually everybody I work with. Uh, and I have enormous hope in young people. As I mentioned, my own daughter is a lawyer. She teaches law at Boston University uh, and teaches immigration law, asylum, and uh, uh, helps to run the clinic for immigration, asylum, and human trafficking. And she and her students are fierce advocates and believers in the law and how the law can really bring justice in the world. And she keeps, tries to keep me honest. <laughs> she tries to keep me honest. And I think young people do that. They remind us of um, the importance of bringing our whole selves, not separating out, going back to the personalization of the law, bring our whole selves, bring our own life experiences uh, to what we do and who we are. Because everybody else does, whether they know it or not. Thank you all. And thank you thank for you. what you do every day. I give Rich a hard time sometimes. <laughs> so do we. Uh, we, give, <laughs> we give all the lawyers a hard time sometimes because uh, we have to slow down until the lawyers tell us it's OK. <laughs> but we wouldn't be able to achieve justice if we didn't. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.